your source for everything paranormal. Para X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. everybody and thank you for joining me tonight on stirring the cauldron um here on parax radio of course if you can't listen live i just want to mention this or prefer to chill with a podcast when you've got some free time this and many other archived stirring the cauldron podcasts are available on my website stirring the cauldron page at www.marlabrooks.com And you can also subscribe to podcasts on iTunes, and they will be magically delivered to your iPod and whatever other device you want them to be delivered to. So just, you know, filling you in. And that being said, um, tonight's opening music was a little bit strange in a way. Um, It's called The Truth in the Stones by Kevin MacLeod. And it fits the theme of the show because Nicholas Pearson is back again with a brand new book called Crystal Healing for the Heart. And it's about gemstone therapy for physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. And those of you who are regular listeners to the show know that Nicholas also has been immersed in all aspects of the Mineral Kingdom for 20 years and more. And in fact, he's been teaching crystal workshops since high school and then later went on to study mineral science at Stetson University's Gillespie Museum. He's a certified teacher in Usui Reiki and now teaches crystal and Reiki classes throughout the United States. And in addition to his latest book, he's also the author of The Seven Archetypal Stones as well as Crystals for Karmic Healing. And he hinted that there was another book coming, but we'll talk about that later. Um, (laughs) Nicholas, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me, Marla. It's a pleasure. I'm so grateful to be back. Oh, well, we're grateful to have you because we learn a lot. I learn a lot. You know, I read your books. I'm like, wow, okay, I didn't know that. So, you know, you can teach an old witch new tricks, and that's that's (laughs) really wonderful. And, you know, we were talking just for a second before the show um, about the conditions, what's going on in the world, how people are saying that things are really weird, um, they're feeling weird, empaths are really being affected by the storms, by the stupidity stupidity like las vegas thing going on last week um but 
you know, and I've even heard people say that they feel like it's building towards something. And the fact that it's building towards something isn't a good thing. Um, but, you know, people cope in different ways. And you brought up a really salient point that crystals can help with what's going on in the world. And so let's talk about that for just a little minute, because I think everybody kind of needs a, a shot in the arm of that. Yeah, I mean, let's let's face it, we live in the epitome of interesting times, uh, for better or worse. And, you know, those of us who are sensitive are, are feeling the repercussions of this. You know, Mother Earth is responding to the exponential boom in population and, you know, the way our technologies pollute and rape and pillage the environment. And then, you know, we've got all these fun social, political, personal things going on in the world as well that are just adding a, another layer to it. And, mm-hmm. you know, the thing is that we we aren't, we aren't at war with the Earth. She's not trying to get rid of us. We are a part of her body, the same as rocks and trees and the air that we breathe. So when we forget that, when we feel this sort of distance, this separation between us and our environment, you know, working with stones is a great way to get us back in touch with it. I mean, they're the literal body and bones of the Earth Mother. And what yeah. better way to, to harmonize ourselves on a personal as well as planetary scale? Mm-hmm. Well, I know there's no quick fix, but I mean, just for people who are kind of like overwhelmed right now with things, what would be um, some of the stones or crystals that they should be hanging on to and working with? Well, you know, the, it, you're right. It isn't a quick fix or magic bullet. And, you know, we're not all necessarily responding to the same things in the same way. So there might not be a universal answer. But I think mm-hmm. one of the things we can all work with right now is rhodochrosite. Rhodochrosite is very healing. It's a balm to the inner child. It promotes inner freedom. And it also helps us kind of break free out of, like, karmic ruts. You know, if you do the mm-hmm. same thing over and over again, you get the same results. And that's basically what's been going on for a long time. So Mm -hmm. this can kind of give us the, the inner forgiveness, the ability to, to turn inward at that small self, that little innocent self that has recorded all this pain and doesn't necessarily process it on the same cognizant intellectual level that our adult minds do and say, okay, you know, you've been so brave through this. Let's do something different. I give you permission Mm -hmm. to, to just go out and explore. Um, Mm -hmm. It's also, uh, a really loving stone. It can be in its in its most crystalline and gemmy forms, or it's transparent enough to be cut and faceted into gemstones. It is a harsh teacher, but when we look at the more commonly available kinds, um, there's sort of creamy swirls of peach and pink. It's it's a lot gentler. Um, mm-hmm. Not to say that the harsh version isn't loving. Let's face it. Sometimes showing love is setting boundaries, saying no, saying get the heck out of my space. So, yeah. um, you know it. It's a stone that can empower us to do those things. As Mm -hmm. sensitive people, we we often give too much of ourselves, but Mm -hmm. not enough to ourselves. And this is a stone that I think is really good for self-care and is uh, very well suited to the changing world in which we live. And can people, like I know people, um, certain people like go to a particular stone when they're feeling upset. It's like their worry stone, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily have to be what, some of the properties are, I kind of think that the stone sort of adjusts to the person in a sense and kind of helps out. So like some people will immediately when they're upset or jittery or something, they grab a moonstone, for example, yeah. and just, you know, use it like worry beats kind of. So, Absolutely. so it does, it, if anybody has a particular stone that they, they wear a lot or they just, you know, do that, but this is a good time. Just walk right around, hold it in your hand, you know, um, just, the feeling of it is going to do something. And, and you know, it, we can also pray for things to change, which helps too. But <laughs> yes. Yeah. But knowing that there are crystals and things that are, that are going to help a little bit. I mean, that's really important. And I don't think a lot of people necessarily think about that. You know, we're, we're just so bombarded with the negativity and obviously, I mean, there's reason there's, there's no question about it. But somewhere along the line, you have to just look for that little sliver of, of hope or of faith or of calm and just hold on to that little thing. Um, and if it's a stone, that that so much the better. Because, I mean, I find, especially polished stones, you know, I find them very, very comfortable to just kind of sit and play with in my hands because it, it is a little bit relaxing. 
Absolutely. You know, and it's so true. We say it doesn't really matter what the textbook properties of something might mm. be. You know, for me, my go-to stone when I'm shaken up, when I've just got one of those days, is I, I turn to Petersite. And for many, many people, that is a very intense, storm-driven energy. Um, it might feel too chaotic in an already chaotic world. But for me, it's like finding the the eye of the hurricane, you know, that's still space. It might be total chaos around you, but, but it gives me that clear mind and that mm-hmm. clear clarity to see what's going on. Um, plus, it is kind of a kick-ass energy stone, so it, it often motivates me to get things done on a personal level. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that helps. And somebody said go to quartz, um, but quartz is kind of like the all-around cure-all. Yeah, for kind sure. Of what it's, so, yeah, if you don't have anything else, quartz crystal is really good, right? Absolutely. Yeah, um, I just got a question. Can you repeat that first one that you mentioned? Um, wrote a... Wrote a hmm? Yeah, I rhodo- didn't. you got it. Rhodochrosite. Rhodochrosite. Okay. Yeah, they didn't catch it either. All right. So that's just something, you know, we're getting into the book right now, but that was just something that, that was a very good idea that people just, you know, do whatever you can to help yourself through this thing. I mean, if it calms you down for five minutes, that's five minutes more than you had yesterday. So, you know, just just keep that in mind. And and. You know, look up the stones, you know, just figure it out, um, see what's good for you or what isn't, and, and go from there. All right. Now, let's get to the book. Um, you know, to some people, the title may be kind of taken at face value and might be believed to be mending a broken heart in a romantic sort of way. But mm-hmm. the book embraces many different aspects on understanding the language of the heart and the journey to wholeness. Um why don't you just talk a little bit about the heart, both the literal and metaphorical um, passages and and what this book is really about? Yeah, so, um, you know, to begin with, I started teaching a workshop with almost an identical title, uh, maybe 2009. I think I planted some seeds for it in a more generalized workshop the year before. So this is material that I have been working on, not, not just in a pre- presenting it to the public kind of way, but in internalizing it, using it for my own life. So this book is really personal to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I'm i the kind of guy who likes to know the hows and whys of things, not just the end results. I mean, that's kind of apparent when you read my books. It's not a prescriptive, this rock gives you this benefit in your life um, kind of approach. I, I like to look at that inner world. And so if I'm going to write a book about wholeness and, you know, you know heartfelt good vibes and heart healing and we're going to start by looking at the heart and you know on a very physical physiological level the heart is a hollow muscular organ that is responsible for distributing um, nourishment to every organ tissue and cell of your body as well as removing the waste from every one of those components of you Um, Mm -hmm. it's this continuous path that is um, you know, comprised of your circulatory system that's driven by your heart. Your heart has two atria, two ventricles. It's got, you know, some of those are responsible for public, uh, pumping blood away from the heart. Others are responsible for receiving blood from the rest of the body. So we see this sort of equal measure of give and take. The heart is telling us you, you can't give more than you're receiving and you can't receive more than you're giving. It's all about balance. That sort of four chambered symbolism relates to the four seasons, the four elements. Um, You know, we see a whole lot of wholeness embodied right there in the heart itself. A lot Mm -hmm. of, you know, metaphors can be drawn from that. Yeah. Uh, um, You know, something else that's really important to know about the heart is your heart is actually the organ that coordinates everything else going on in your body. And, Mm -hmm. you know, after a conventional education, you would probably think, but wait, isn't that the brain's job? And Mm -hmm. um, I think my favorite metaphor I've ever seen for this is to sort of liken every part of your body to being a different uh, member of an orchestra. And Mm -hmm. we have, you know, central right there on, on the podium. We have the conductor and his score. Now, your brain contains the information for what every cell should be doing. That is the music that every musician should be reading. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's what every individual part would be. But to get everyone on the same page, 
playing in time. That's the job of the conductor, and your heart is that conductor. I mean, literally, it is keeping time. It is pulsing that beat, that rhythm, with every heartbeat that you've got. Mm -hmm. um, but what this also does is it, it creates this beautiful electromagnetic field. Now, the contraction of that muscular tissue that it's made from is generating a whole lot of electricity. Mm -hmm. um, and that electromagnetic field that your heart is producing is... Um, 80 times stronger electrically and 100 times stronger magnetically than that of your brain. Wow. So your aura, even if we're just looking at it in terms of the measurable science, your aura is predominantly comprised of the electromagnetic field that your heart produces. And you can detect that field of energy 100 times farther away than the field of the brain. Mm. And that should tell us quite a lot there. That means it's one of our primary sense organs. And, you know, it's not one of our five physical senses. Mm -hmm. um, although we have more than that. We have the sense of hunger and the sense of thirst and other things that go on that, we, <laughs> right. you know, are out, outside of those five. But your, your heart is constantly interacting with every other energy field that you come in contact with through a process called entrainment. Um, you know, one energy field exchanges information with another and they kind of sync up, they synchronize or harmonize. Um, mm -hmm. We do this all the time when someone walks into the same room as us, and when they're in a really foul mood, you can feel them even without looking at the expression on their face. You know what <laughs> yes. they're in. <laughs> when someone is exuberant and you know just has this unbridled joy, you you kind of feel that laughter welling up inside you, even though it's not your emotion. And that's because your energy fields are a reflection of what you think, what you feel, who you're with, what you're eating, the colors you're wearing the stones you've got in your pockets the activities you're engaged in and mm -hmm. because these energy fields influence um you know our, our sort of emotional state that in turn changes brain chemistry which changes the pathology the physiology the actual biological processes in your physical body so mm -hmm. this is this is like the crux of energy medicine right here there is a literal pathway by which the the energies around us and within us are interacting with our biological systems so you know if we look at the most important energy field we've got it's that of the heart so if we have everything sort of focused around this heart-centered state of being then we can fix the conductor of the orchestra all the other musicians are going to keep time with that conductor so that, that's why the book is all about healing the heart it's not just about getting over a bad emotional state or healing childhood right. trauma um, this is this is where true, authentic spiritual growth takes place. It is only at the level of the heart do we evolve. Mm. Yeah, that's kind of amazing. Um, it, it, it's I, I didn't think of it. You know, the way you explained it kind of opened my eyes a little bit to the fact that you know everything orchestrates behind the scenes, and we don't know it, but but it's an ongoing process, and that's that's a really good point to make. Um, now, what is heart-centered living? For me, this is just showing up with your whole heart to whatever you're doing. Uh, you might call it authenticity. You might call it living in the moment. I think it's all of these things and maybe a little bit more. But it is... We are sort of trained, at least in the Western world, to do exactly the opposite of that. We, we show up ego-identified, body-identified, and not soul-identified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this sort of misattribution of our true nature, the, the misrepresentation of what we're really about as, as human beings, as spiritual beings, having a human experience, um, mm -hmm. is where so much of our challenges come from in life. If we could, from an early age, learn how to show up with our whole heart in everything, mm -hmm. then, you know, I, I think we, we'd fix most of the world's problems in a few generations. Yeah, that's, that's probably true. Now, I was going to ask you about this anyway, but a question just came up in the chat room. Um, does the heart chakra determine the aura and the upper self? And in the book, you talk about um, the heart chakra specifically. I mean, you talk about the other ones, too. Um, but you have an exercise there and, and pictures. And and that's the other thing I just want to throw into people. He's got so many pictures in this book, and they're of him doing things and pointing it out. You know, it's like the picture worth, worth a thousand words. It really is. Because you know, instead of somebody saying, here, put it there, you can see it. So this is wonderful. Uh, but 
maybe I, I know people probably know the term chakra, but maybe not know what the chakras do. But I want to. So maybe you could just explain a little bit about chakras for one second, and then let's talk about the heart chakra specifically and what we yeah. can do. For yeah. sure. So um, you know, our word chakra comes from the Sanskrit root chakra, uh, which means wheel. Um, the sort of modern use of chakras is very different to how they looked in Vedic teachings several thousand years ago, and that's a conversation for a whole other day. <laughs> um, this, the seven colors that we associate with the, the chakra system that was adopted in the year 1977. I promise we've had chakras for longer than that. So, um, <laughs> you know, what this tells us is we're not limited only to the colors uh, associated with that That one model. Um, and therefore, we're not limited to which stones that we use. Any stone can be used on any chakra if, if that benefit is useful for that energy center. But um, mm -hmm. essentially what these are, they're almost like, um, on, on one hand, they're like your non-physical anatomy. They're mm -hmm. organs in, in your etheric body. Mm -hmm. So um, the function of these is a lot like our physical glands. What they do is they, uh, on the physical level, what glands do is they regulate the hormonal balance of your body. They allow um, you know, different chemical substances to be secreted for metabolism, for digestion, for how you feel, for your sleep cycle. And on a non-physical level, these are, these are like doorways, if you will, through which the soul is stepped down into physical body. So there are mm -hmm. biological functions associated with each chakra. So like the heart chakra is located in, in the middle of the sternum, right next to the heart. So the heart kind of falls under its jurisdiction. But also there's a sort of emotional component that's, that's really important. And with the heart, it's, it's about, you know, the realization that everything in the universe is a manifestation of love, which can be a, a lot to take in. Um, but every physical thing that you touch on one level or another, we could look at as being uh, the result of, of creator, of goddess, of the god, of whatever words feel good to you the flying hippopotamus in the night sky. It could be anything. Um, mm -hmm. what, whatever we view as creator, the physical world and all other worlds were created as that first extension of source wanting to know itself, the first act of love, being able to share this love with itself and to sort of stretch out and multiply and divide and, and create everything that we know. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, the heart chakra, we associate it with the color green and, and um, gemstone therapy, the green rays function is to teach us that everything in the physical world is a manifestation of spirit. Everything in spirit is comprised of love. So, um, you know, on a psychological level, obviously, then love and romance and relationships will naturally fall under the sector of the heart chakra. But there's, there's so much more to it. Mm -hmm. So every one of these energy centers has a sort of, um, you know, an, an opportunity for growth, a lesson that's encoded in it. Uh, mm -hmm. in the earliest Vedic iterations of these, um, they weren't so much believed to be um, portals or vortexes like we see them today. They were more like stages of, of spiritual growth. So they were mm -hmm. more metaphors rather than literal components of your spiritual body. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that level of representing our growth is, is still in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And... and um... Uh, I think what might be tied into this, but I just have to tell you, something came up in chat room that's really a really good simile. Um, Kat said that the chakras are sort of organs of the soul rather than the body. That, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I kind of like that. Um, all right, so you also talk in the book about finding your heart's rhythm, our heart's rhythm. And mm -hmm. you give kind of a step-by-step -step instruction on how to do it. And the process is kind of a way to become centered, I guess, or as you say, more like contemplation. Um, why do we need to find that rhythm and how do we do it? Well, I think, one, it's a self-awareness thing. If, if you can kind of check in with your heart, you probably get, supposing you do it, with your whole heart, you show up authentically and say, okay, I'm going to take two minutes, just two minutes. One, it cuts you off from all the things in your life that might be distracting you. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, you can check in with soul. And that's a, a really just healthy ex experience to have on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other hand, you know, if your heart rate is going crazy, then obviously it's trying to tell you something. And hopefully mm -hmm. by doing an exercise like this, you, you might come to the bottom of that. Um, you know, very simply, um, although 
other step-by-step instructions in the book. The, uh-huh. the, the Reader's Digest version is find quiet space and feel your heartbeat and just attune to that. See what it does. As you, as you breathe, as you find stillness, mm-hmm. um, it will more than likely change. In most cases, it will slow down and relax, um, which mm-hmm. is very good for you. Mm-hmm. And so when, like, people have tachycardia or, or just, you know, anxiety, and, I mean, we all do that, and, you know, or we, we kind of make our heart go really quick. Um, do you find that doing this, finding the rhythm will allow us to also, if we're thinking hard enough about it and being, as you said, authentic, um, we can we slow this down, stop the palpitation, stop the, the rapid beat, do you think? Um, I mean, in my own life, this is something that I have definitely – felt on a first-hand basis. There are lots of studies that show that um, with enough conscious attunement, we can influence our heart rate, as well as our blood pressure and our skin mm-hmm. galvanic response. All these things that we don't view as being voluntary responses are, are sort of tied into that primordial part of the brain that just kind of feels rather than thinks. Mm-hmm. Um, so by, by consciously feeling, you know, peace, calm, joy, whatever it is for you, you're, mm-hmm. you're going to see a change. Mm-hmm. Just practice things perfect, kind of, and exactly, and just it's not the only benefit of it, but you know, just doing it will probably have one benefit that kind of turns into another and another, and eventually, this is a really good thing. But we were talking, you mentioned it, and I, I use the word too about living authentically. Now, define that. For me, this is like taking down that facade of the ego, mm-hmm. and. Li- Living with that, you know, soul identified purpose. Uh, this is not living according to someone else's expectations or definitions of what your life path should be. Um, mm-hmm. It also doesn't mean going crazy just because you can, but it's it's showing up with your whole heart. You know, the word courage um, mm-hmm. in English comes via French cure, meaning heart. Mm-hmm. Um, That's right. So to be courageous is literally just to put your heart into something. And that is the very definition of living authentically for me. It's just putting your heart into what you do. Okay. And that shouldn't be that hard because I think we all do it at some point if something is important enough to us. But it's probably a good thing to kind of do it all the time if you can. You know, rather than being like half-hearted, <laughs> um, you know, sometimes and and – and more serious about it others. I mean, it probably is just good for the soul and good for the mind to just kind of get that other junk out of the way, all those spider webs and things, right? Absolutely. You know, there's um, there's this really beautiful um, short little poem. It's called a, a waka or gyose. It's a specific style of poetry um, mm-hmm. uh, that was favored by the, um, the emperor in Japan, especially Emperor Meiji. Um, who was famous for reunifying and centralizing Japan's Mm -hmm. uh, rule under the imperial uh, rule again after the Tokugawa shogunate. And he wrote 100,000 of these. Um, Oh. Right. He he was quite the poet. (laughs) Oh. Um, His wife wrote uh, tens of thousands of them. So they they did a lot of this. And a lot of them focus on the theme of the heart and authenticity. But there's, um, of these, 125 were actually chosen as teaching tools by the founder of Reiki. And Mm -hmm. one of them is just, just titled mirror Uh and the i'm I'm paraphrasing my my literal japanese translation wouldn't sound very nice but the the (laughs) idea is that um you know the the speaker of the poem in other words the emperor himself says that um you know from any person any status we can learn to polish the mirror of our heart just by watching them do something authentically you know, the idea is that when we meet someone who's living their life's purpose, whether that person is a humble farmer or a Fortune 500 CEO or a writer or a podcaster or a taxi driver, you know when you meet someone who's just living their life as wholly and fully and lovingly as they can, and you go, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm a little touched by this. Uh, I, this happened once. Um, I used to ride a motorcycle, and the owner of the shop where I took it, the mechanic, would just every time something was going wrong wrong, and I'm not a that's that's not my field of expertise I'm not at all automotively inclined and (laughs) he would just explain things to me Mm -hmm. and you know it sounded like he was speaking Greek to me but he would break it down and he would do it with so much patience and so much kindness that he was he was living his life's purpose doing that and that that 
that opened my heart just to be in the presence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense, you know. Um, huh, well, we all need to work on that a little bit. But um, it's funny because uh, somebody in the chat room said, you could say it in literal Japanese. She might understand it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think any of – well, maybe somebody else would. I don't know. <laughs> but it, it's cool that, you know, it's good to be bilingual, trilingual, and, and whatever. Um You know, I was just going to go into some of the different chapters and the use of stones for specific things. And I just got a question from the chat room, which makes kind of a great lead in to working with stones. Um, They want to know if it makes a difference if we use either polished stones or raw stones. Is one more powerful than the other? Um, More powerful, I don't think, is the word here. But we can think of it as form follows function. So... um, you know, if you have the need to sort of um, sort of draw something out of a specific chakra center or cut a cord from your aura, then you might want something that is kind of pointed or blade shaped or, you know, mm-hmm, otherwise mm-hmm. very directional. Whereas right. if you want to find some sort of center stillness, you might go with a rounder, more polished form. Um, if you're laying something on the body, spheres don't do a very good job of staying where they're put. So something right. flat, whether it's raw or polished, would would be your ideal choice. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, use what you've got, for one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, make use of the tools that are already in your toolbox. There's no need to go out and, you know, drop $1,000 on, on new crystals, right. unless you yeah. have it and want to, in which case, by all <laughs> means. Yes. <laughs> Post uh-huh. pictures, tag me in them, I want to see. Uh, yeah. but, um, you know, really... If you're attracted to something raw, use something raw. If you're attracted to something polished, use something polished. There are some specific schools of working with crystals and gemstones. Like in gemstone therapy, we use mostly spheres and just extraordinarily high-quality ones. And mm-hmm. in you know something like ruby or emerald or sapphire, uh, naturally, these are going to be very, very tiny things to be right. in anyone's budget. Yeah. Um, but also because those are mineral species that don't tend to come very large and very perfect at the same time. So, yeah. um, you know, it kind of depends on who you ask. Different different ways of working will have specific protocols. Yeah, and being drawn to certain things anyway. I mean, sometimes a polished stone will bring out the beauty of whatever it was raw. You know, I mean, you have to look a little harder and stuff. But And sometimes it's the feel, but I, I have both. Um you know, I'm kind of like, yeah, okay, I like that, I like that, and and I don't care if they're one way or the other. That's just kind of what I'm drawn to, yeah, or what's available, you know, at the time. But um, you know, certain things are just gorgeous when they're polished, and you can see all the different facets and everything. And then others are just, you know, they are what they are. But you hold them in your hand and you feel them. So you know, it's it's not always the looks. Like in anything, it's not always the look. Yeah. It's, it's the feel and, and what it, how it makes you feel. Agreed. All right. And now, I know we talked about this on a past show, but maybe some people haven't heard it. But again, before we get into working with stones, I think it bears repeating once again that, um, you know, there, there's going to be people who will read your books and find a whole lot of crystals and stones that they want to run out and get, which is, like you said, great. And, you know, there's a couple now I've been making notes about, too. Um, and so, you know, and, and to get them to work with the exercises that you give in the book. So can we kind of go over the importance and the necessity of um, what I refer to as the three C's, cleansing, mm-hmm. charging, and consecrating? Absolutely. Because, you know, you never want to pick up a crystal and, and and from a shop, you know, in a cult shop, wherever you get it, and try to work with it immediately without first getting rid of the energy of, you know, who knows what, those hundred people that left them on the stone. So let's let's briefly do that because that's always a question that does come up. This is such a vital part of the practice. Um, you know, just like you wouldn't go to a surgeon and ex, you know, they they wouldn't use the last patient's tools on you for your surgery. They would certainly have everything cleaned and sanitized and everything would be hygienic. In in the case of energy therapy, we need to practice good spiritual hygiene as well. Even mm-hmm. if we're only ever working on ourselves, this is something we need to do. When mm-hmm. you have a bowl of cereal in the morning, most of us don't use yesterday's bowl without washing it first. So right. it's the same idea. Even though it's it's your own ick, <laughs> you, you don't need to subject yourself to it on purpose. Right. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, cleansing, 
in, in short, it's not about taking out bad energy and putting in good energy. It's taking out old patterns mm-hmm. um, that might not be aligned with the same goal we're working on now. Okay. So okay. crystals are natural storage devices. They they want to soak up impressions of you know whatever space they're in. Mm-hmm. So when it's time to do a specific therapy, we want to make sure that we take out all the old and mm-hmm. we have room for the new. So that's what the cleansing part is about. You might use the breath, you might use flower essences or gem essences. Um, there's a diamond spray that I'm particularly fond of using for cleansing. Mm. Um, some people like sunlight that bleaches some stone. Yeah. And some yeah. people like moonlight. Um, you know, full moon only comes once a month though. So if you're doing daily therapies, it's it's a inconvenient to wait for the full moon. So mm-hmm. use what you've got, use the things that work for you. Um, Incense. Originally, is, when I wrote this book, yeah. yeah, incense, sage, sweetgrass, Palo Santo, whatever works for you. Um, Simple, when I wrote yeah. this book originally, it kind of skipped over all those beginner things because I'd already iterated it twice in two other books. Then we decided, you know what, uh, let's make this as as user friendly as possible. So there's an appendix mm-hmm. in it that goes through these three steps. So it gives you some ideas mm-hmm. for cleansing um, and takes you through the rest. Right, and it's as you said, it's the way you do it. You know, some people will run things through sea salt, although sea salt may be abrasive to certain stones. Um, right. But you know, do what what you need or salt water. Yeah, well, even that. But if you're used to doing any kind of thing like that, do it. And again, incense, simple things. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You don't have to get specific tools. It's just you know, that's the way it is. And and also. Um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned in a way is that stones are not the be all and the end all. I mean, all the stones are to be used as guides or caretakers and helpers. Um, and and they're not magic beans, for example. So, you know, it's just you plant in them what you need. You, you, you cherish them. You love them. You take care of them. And, you know, they will work. Yeah. Yeah. More or less. Um, it, well, it depends on, you know, it's like casting a spell. You know this. If you're not whole, if you don't believe in the stones, if you don't believe in the crystals, they're not going to work well for you. You know, it, it's it's just one of those kind of metaphysical things. You have to believe in what you're doing and, and what you're doing it with has to believe in you that you know what you're doing and you want to be doing it, right? Yeah, I mean, that's that whole showing up with your whole heart thing again. It just mm-hmm. comes down to one, being really present and to being invested. I mean, I could be totally present at something and, and not, not care one way or another about, about me being there. And there's a time and a place for that. And sometimes mm-hmm. that's how I feel when I sit in front of the television. You know, I, I don't really care what's on the screen. I'm just decompressing. So I'm just there for the sake of being there. Right. But if you're engaged in these spiritual practice, showing up is only half the battle. Um, intention mm-hmm. is only a piece of the, the puzzle. We have to really, we have to, we have to want it. We have to give ourselves mm-hmm. over to it so we can become from those empty vessels, that hollow reed through which the magic of the universe can flow. Mm-hmm. That's true. Um, you know, something that people will expect to hear is about stones for falling in love. Now, mm-hmm. you talk about that in the book, but to be clear, you refer to them as support tools rather than a love potion, per se, because they can't create love out of nothing. So, um, you know, and, and I have to say, as I toss this to you, is um, that you really have the most stunning pictures of the various stones in the book. I mean, it's just falling in love. Is It's falling in love with those pictures and all the stones that go with it are rather amazing. But as I said, um, I got sidetracked for a minute, but you're, the stones that you use are not to bring love to you. It's not like a come hither spell. It, they're mm-hmm. more they're more to help you be open enough to attract, right? Is that kind of where I'm going here? Yes, and you know, I think part of it is you know the audience for sure that I'm I'm geared at is is wider than just the sort of magical community. Although right. I I definitely hope they will and read and enjoy this book. Um, yeah. So I wanted to use protocols that I think all of us would be familiar with and comfortable with. And then the other part is um, at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. The only love you can be responsible for in your own life is the love you have for yourself and the love you share for your relationship with the divine, um, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, that's a two way street. The good news is that the divine loves you unconditionally at all times. You can't, you can't change that just by mm-hmm. being here it is evidence that that love exists. Mm-hmm. Um, 
the same sh- should be true of the love we have with ourselves, but it's that whole ego piece, the mm-hmm. programming that we take on earlier in life that can get in the way. So um, in the chapter on romancing the heart, uh, chapter mm-hmm. six, you know, that's where we talk about the stones for falling in love. Mm-hmm. And it's about allowing yourself to receive love and tenderness, nurturing seeds of love, nurturing that romance, finding balance in relationships, learning mm-hmm. how to take healthy risks. Um, mm-hmm. Not not every relationship is going to be rainbows and sunshine all the time. Sometimes you, you have to take a chance. You have to make bold moves. And these are the kinds of stones that can help you do that within reason, of course. Don't just move across the country on a whim, but do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Do it off. Tend yeah. to do it smartly. Right. And you just mentioned about stones for falling in love, but you also talk about stones for staying in love. And like, you know, once we succeed in falling in love, staying in love is the next possible step. And um, so you've got things. One thing that's really good, and, and I think this is, is wonderful for the staying in love part, is um, the partner meditation. You know, I mean, it's there to nurture the love and keep better communication and heal the emotional wounds and all the rest of that. Um, it, it, it's good. I mean, it's sharing. That That's a brilliant thing to put, put in the book. Thank you. And the, the, the model in that photo of the partner meditation happens to be my other half. And he's responsible for all the beautiful photography, all the artwork and imagery that you see in the book. He he did all of that. So it was really lovely to collaborate on this very loving heart-centered project with someone I share my heart with. Exactly. And, and like I said before, the pictures are wonderfully done and the stones. The pictures, oh, it was just like I want every one of those stones that I see in there because they're just so beautiful and enticing. They call out to me. So he's really, really good. Um, sure. All right. So then what naturally follows the love and partnership aspect of the relationship um, comes the need for stones for forgiveness, don't you think? Um, that's you know, it, it's a natural progression. Yeah, and you know, um, the way I've kind of got the the book laid out, um, one, it, it kind of presumes you've had a loving relationship at some point in life, or at least something that ought to have been a loving relationship. So, um, you know, that whole forgiveness part, hopefully is something we're working on before trying to drag someone else into our mess. In real life, I know it doesn't work in that linear progression. So, <laughs> so perfectly timed, but for, mm-hmm. you know, forgiveness is essentially um, uh, defined by a course in miracles. Forgiveness is the selective remembering of only the lo- loving part. Uh, that doesn't mean that you forget the rest. Mm-hmm. It just means that we're not going to dwell on it. Forgiveness is being able to say, you know what, you might have been a schmuck, but I know you're human, and so mm-hmm. am I, and mm-hmm. we we shared love regardless. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that you have to follow up with, so let's make the same mistakes again. It's perfectly okay to say, I forgive you, but stay the heck away from me. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that forgiveness part starts with, <laughs> it's true, um, you know, the forgiveness part starts with childhood the the first people that we have to forgive is out, outside of ourselves or our family because they're the people we spend our formative years with and if if you can show me any person who has never had conflict with their family i will probably show you a fictional character um <laughs> you, we all have that it's part of what we agree to 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 come to earth and have this wonderful learning experience or not so wonderful as the case might be um, mm-hmm. and then grow from that to take those lessons that we've mastered and apply them to everything else in life but the thing is most of us kind of get hung up on those lessons we haven't quite figured out where the love is gift and all that so yeah. working with the inner child is a really great way to do some deeply rooted healing mm-hmm Mm-hmm. And, you know, well, so um, when we're talking about forgiveness, um, we need to choose each stone carefully because they need to match the situation that needs to be forgiven or resolved, correct? Yes. You know, there, by and large, there are some stones that I think are pretty universal when it comes to forgiveness. Um, Dioptase is one of my favorites. It's not everybody's budget, but um, I think it's a fabulous stone. Um, it helps us release the victim and victimizer roles. Mm-hmm. And um, just about in any situation there is to be forgiven, you, you have a forgiver and a forgive e, which means you have victim and victimizer. So, um, you know, I think that one could apply to just about anything. It's it's just universal enough, but 
are plenty of others that might work more on, you know, parent child relationships or, you know, ex lover relationships, you know, things of that nature. Um, so there are different stones to help you through that. All right, let's let's go through a couple of different stones for different reasons because um, people get confused, and I don't know this is true or not, but I know when I go to buy stones, they go to you know, go to different places, and sometimes they explain what the stone is, sometimes they don't. But I've noticed sometimes that um, in different places the stone is described for something different, you know, not what yeah. you think it was, you know, like hematite. I always think of hematite for healing. Now I know there's other things that it does, but if if somebody is selling like you know, here's your little box of hematite, and they don't mention healing, I get suspicious, you know, I mean, because I I personally think that's kind of a a major thing about hematite. But if somebody was going to get an arsenal of stones, um, what would, all right, you were talking, you know, the book, The Seven Archetypal Stones, but if somebody just needs just a really basic, basic group of maybe three or four, what would you suggest? Oh, um, you know, there's a good challenge. I would say within the context of this book, um, I think maybe my my top three or four. For one, aquamarine, it is so versatile. We can use it for releasing blocked emotions. We can use it to draw in more love. Um, it's a wonderful stone for expression. And if, you know, if we have stagnant expression, then we're not living from the heart because we can't let anyone know what's what's in the heart itself. Mm-hmm. Um, very detoxifying on the spiritual, the mental, emotional, as well as the physical level. Uh, mm-hmm. I'd, I would definitely put Obsidian in this group. We, we talked mm-hmm. about it with the first book. Um, mm-hmm. It pops up in my second book. It's here in this book. I mean, I, I really like Obsidian. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, biases aside, it is a very potent tool and it's an, initi- it's an initiator. Um, mm-hmm. And it's also a really good reflector. So um, if we yeah. need to find some truth in things, this is the stone we go to. And it's not um, it's not a sugar coater, if yeah. you will. Um, mm-hmm. Obsidian shows us what we need to see, whether we like it or not. So we have to be prepared mm-hmm. to do that work. So, um, you, know, you know, it's a twofold process. You want to build up your strength, your resilience, your reserve of stick with itness. So that way when mm-hmm. Obsidian shows what it's going to show, you're mm-hmm. going to do something about right. it. Um, right. And, you know, after finding that might be a good time to use something like the Aquamarine to release what you find there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think calcite would be such a versatile tool. Um, it's a good way to cheat because it comes in so many different colors of the rainbow that you could get different ones for different aspects. But oh, it's a cool. great inner child stone. It represents spontaneity, the sort of green, vibrant colors really bring us into that forgiving state as well. So we mm-hmm. can do a lot with with that particular stone. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... Pick something with lithium in it. Um, okay. This might be a pink or green tourmaline. This could be lipidolite, which is a lithium-bearing mica. Um, it could be petalite. Uh, it could be sugilite. Lots of different options for lithium stones. Kunzites, mm-hmm. uh, hiddenite. Um, the wonderful thing about this is that minerals rich in lithium help to open the heart center and elevate it. It gives like buoyancy to our emotional mm-hmm. body. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's... Such a wonderful stone. If you are one to be prone to worry or anxiety, let lithium come to the rescue. If you know we have things like um, depression or anything like that, we, we we treat that medicinally with uh, lithium bicarbonate. Ah, yeah. And that has all sorts of fun side effects. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, in in the world of stones, you know, this is energy medicine. You, mm-hmm. you can't. The effects are much gentler in most most cases, but you get a lot right. of the same results. So if we're yeah treating those things with lithium bicarbonate in a clinical sense than in a spiritual sense. Those lithium minerals are going to work on the cause level rather than the symptom level um, that's mm-hmm. causing those sorts of disruptions to our emotional well-being. Um, lithium mm-hmm. stones also tend to be activators of the higher heart chakra, which is a minor energy center that's sort of like blooming in humankind right now. Mm-hmm. We've all had this little bud within us, and mm-hmm. if we work real hard, then maybe it, it it opens, but I, I would say worldwide, it's beginning to open, and that might be part of our greater sensitivity. It might also be why we're seeing so much ugliness. You know, it's part of our right. evolution. We have to look at what we've created and look right. at it earnestly in order to make change mm-hmm. happen. So, um, yeah. you know, those lithium stones can be the the balm that we need in times like this. Okay, great. Um, got to squeeze in another question from the chat room. Zora wants 
to know, well, she says that she uses Blue John while meditating, but she feels very different when holding it with the left hand compared to the right hand. She said, is this, ha- is that happening with all stones or just fluorite? Um, I would say that that's something for you to sort of explore on your own. Um, I, I generally don't have a hard and fast rule, your right hand versus your left hand, your sending hand versus receiving hand. Um, in, in a perfect state, we, we send and receive with both hands. We might be sort of personally predisposed to one way or the other, and so that might do things. There are different meridians running in different fingers and different hands, so that might be part of it as well, but I'm, I'm no expert in Chinese medicine. Um, but try it with some other stones. Experiment with it. You might find that maybe what the uh, the Blue John fluorite is doing is sort of reflecting an imbalance that you've got or showing you a healing opportunity. And that's why you might get that different sensation in one hand or the other. And so you can kind of explore what that is and see if maybe you might harmonize those two spheres, those two uh, aspects of yourself. Good. It's an interesting question. I never thought of it. See, I'm always learning from you you know someday someday i'm going to have a graduate degree in something and and part of it will be from you so i appreciate that um what all right what is the most important aspect of this book i mean it's good for everybody in some ways but what is there one kind of thing that holds it all together why people should start looking at the heart and the stones and everything um take it more seriously than before? Well, you know, I think to be really reductive, we've all got a heart, whether that's, you know, literal or metaphorical, you you can't be here without it. Um, So if we start to recognize the sort of primacy that the heart has in every aspect of our lives, the physical, the psychological, the spiritual, then as we start to work with it, as our primary teacher, as that coordinator or conductor of everything in our energy field, everything in our body, then we really start to work at the core level. Even even the word core comes from the Latin word, also core, which means heart. So, um, you know, if you want to get to the center, the stillness inside every condition in your life, we can do it through the literal or the metaphorical heart. Mm-hmm. And I I really like the part that this deals with the physical, the spiritual, the the metaphysical, I mean, all different aspects of it. And I think when you get that down pat, you're pretty much fairly well covered um, as far as life in general, because the heart is the circle, the core, it's it's the breath, it's the life that we live and how we live it is, is specifically due to that. And there's so many things in the book that teaches you how to fix things how to alter things how to experience things that maybe you haven't experienced before and as i said there there's exercises in every chapter there are pictures um to show you the way and again those lovely lovely stone pictures that i would just like you know i I cut them out and frame them and stick them on the wall you know i'd love to have a stone wall just to those pictures um because they're really really well taken and really gorgeous um we, you know, this is like an hour and so many questions, so little time. And um, I, I have to ask the most important question of all, where can people find you and your books? Mm. Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, <laughs> these days I'm kind of all over the place. Um, Good. So um, my books are available everywhere books are sold. You can visit my publisher's website, which is innertraditions.com. You can also visit Amazon, your local Barnes & Noble. Find your local spiritual store, metaphysical bookstore or cult bookstore. Please support your little mom and pop shops out there because yes. they're, they're the lifeblood of our community. Yep. Um, so that's a great way to do it. Um, I, I teach all over the place if you're in Central Florida or want to be. Um, on the 15th, I have a workshop coming up exploring some very uh, appropriate seasonal topics. Our workshop's called Crystal Vision, and we'll be using stones to enhance um, intuition, clairvoyance. We'll be working with some ancient crystal skulls as well as some modern ones. Oh, wow. uh, finding stones that are good for um, some sort of spiritual protection while you do this kind of work, opening us up to the time when the veil between the worlds is the thinnest. 
Mm-hmm. It's a time of year. Yes. Time to get into it. And you know, at some point, you just mentioned crystal skulls. At some point, I'd really like you to come back and let's just talk an hour about crystal skulls because I, they're intriguing, they're mystifying, they're all they're all kinds of good. So, would you do Absolutely. that down the line? Okay, oh good. yes, that's one of my favorite topics. Oh, good. All right. Um, also, um, tell us really quickly about your visit to Open Times on the Gaia Network. Um, you're on TV now. <laughs> I, I am. This is a really surreal experience. Um, so over the summer, I was invited to go to Denver for the International New Age Trade Show. My publisher uh, brought me out there to do a couple of book signings at the show. And um, some months earlier, I had been networked with one of the producers for for Gaia. And um, we were in talks for another project that we just didn't get the timing right on. But uh, their their studio is like maybe an hour outside of Denver, so mm-hmm. uh, we made some time since I was going to be there, and it almost almost perfectly overlapped with um, the shooting days. I was able to go in with uh, Regina Meredith and sit for uh, an hour interview for her show, Open Minds, and that actually just debuted today. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, it's it's just this magical moment. <laughs> we talked mostly about the seven archetypal stones, but we got to go real deep into some crystal related topics. It was a marvelous experience. She's a great host. You know, she's interviewed anybody and everybody, so she's learned about so many things. She could really um, she threw me a couple of curveballs, and it was fun. Good, yay, good for her. <laughs> That's what we live for. Just so you know, uh, <laughs> it's really important. Um, do you know, so people can just go look on the Gaia network. It's G A I A for anybody who is not familiar with Gaia. Um, all they have to do is a Google search, right, and they'll find it. Absolutely. Okay, so and Gaia dot com will take you to their website, and the show is Open Minds. Okay, cool. I'm going to do that tomorrow. Got to see that. And one more thing, really, really, really quick. Um, you just you dropped the you dropped the carrot. You dangled the carrot. You, you've got <laughs> yes. you're working kind of on a new book, and it's sort of witchy. Yay! Yeah. So um, you know, this is book three. Book four comes out in the spring, and that's a real big departure for me. It's about Reiki. So you know, maybe we'll talk about that in the future. But I yeah. over the summer I started writing a new project, and the the working title, which is subject to change, of course, is Jewels of the Goddess. And it's nice. tapping into that sort of beautiful, raw power of the divine feminine and finding the face of the goddess in the mineral kingdom. And, nice. um, you know, it's it's definitely a little bit witchier than any of my other projects. Well, it's a lot witchier than my other projects. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. This is kind of the, the, the door that got me into where I am today. So it's fun mm-hmm. to go back and revisit it. Um, you know, I've been revisiting my, my own pagan roots as well. So it's, it's just such a fun project and, um, I won't give too much away, but it's going to be a really different way of looking at stones for me. And there are, there's some interesting things that are coming out of it, um, from personal gnosis, not, not things that I've read and researched, but things that I've just lived in and breathed by, by working with these stones firsthand. So brand new material. Oh, great. I'm so looking forward to that. But I'm not looking forward to getting kicked off the network. So um, I think we need to go. And um, yes. so <laughs> it's always a pleasure having you back on the show. Yes, we will definitely do Crystal Skulls. We will talk about Reiki, too, because that's something else. You'll, you'll be back a couple more times. Um, Sounds good. Yeah. I mean, like I said, if you like it or not. Uh, <laughs> but um, it's a pleasure having you here. And I want to thank everybody else who's tuning into the show as well. And until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2014. Moonlight Hall by Kevin McLeod. Licensed through Incompetech.com.